on behalf of the American Theater and Drama Society, let me welcome you to our virtual session titled Staging Democracy, Politics and Political Figures in 20th, 21st Century American Drama. American Literature Association, which I'm going to refer to as ALA from now on, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, offered member societies like us the option of pre-recording our session. And in response to travel restrictions from Europe and the continuing uncertainty facing our esteemed scholars who are from Europe, uh, ATDS, American Theater and Drama Society, decided to pre-record the session. As such, we recorded the session on July 1st, 2021. My name is Muhammad Ali Dabiri, I go by Al. I'm the panel chair and ATDS liaison to ALA conference. I'm a doctoral student of educational leadership at the University of Missouri, Columbia, and project coordinator at the Louis Stokes Regional Center of Excellence for a study of STEM intervention. And I'm also part of the Circa STEM Advisory Council. Our first presenter today is Dr. Hannah Simpson. She is the Rosemary Panter, uh, Pantney Junior Research Fellow in Theater and Performance at St. Anne's College, University of Oxford. She has two monographs forthcoming, Fitness in Pain, Samuel Beckett and Post-War Francophone Theater with Oxford University Press, and Samuel Beckett and Disability Performance with Paul Grave Macmillan. She is currently working on a new monograph project tentatively entitled The Unexpected Dramatic Modernism's Forgotten Stage Plays, which explores the forgotten plays of modernist novels. So uh, Dr. Simpson is all yours. Thank you. Um, I'm after a year of pandemic life, I'm still slow on screen sharing, etc. So bear with me. Um, there we go. Can everybody see the first slide? Well, thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here or for watching us later on our recording, of course. Um, I'm in the very, very early stages of this project on modernist novelists as would-be playwrights. So I'm very keen to hear any thoughts you might have in our Q&A section. So F. Scott Fitzgerald is best known to us as a novelist and a short story writer, albeit one with a well-documented interest in cinema. However, Fitzgerald wrote and even staged theatre pieces right across his lifetime. And today I'm going to focus on The Vegetable or From President to Postman, the only one of Fitzgerald's stage plays to ever receive a professional production. The Vegetable is a surreal fantasy farce which Fitzgerald wrote during 1922. It was published in April, 1923 and staged in Atlantic City in November that same year. In Act One, we meet Republican everyman Jerry Frost, who works a low-ranking job in a railway company. He tells his wife that he wanted to be a postman when he was a boy, and when she laughs at him, he angrily tells her he could have been President of the United States if he hadn't met her. At the end of Act One, after a visit from a bootlegger, we get a surprise call from Mr Jones, who has come from that evening's Republican convention and announces to Jerry that on the first ballot, you were unanimously given the Republican nomination for president and Jerry is carried out in triumph. In act two, we find Jerry installed in the White House as president and inevitably he causes one disaster after another through inexperience, incompetence and bravado. The state of Idaho starts impeachment proceedings against him and Jerry tries to sell the state to the new country of Irish Poland. The deal falls through when it's revealed that Jerry's father, whom he made Secretary of the Treasury, has lost all of America's money. Jerry is impeached and thrown out of the White House. His generals look set to start a new war. And then it's revealed that all of Act Two was a fever dream caused by the bootlegger's dodgy gin. In Act Three, 
Jerry has renounced his old life and is now happily and confidently working as, quote, the best postman in the world. The vegetable was widely expected to be a success. Fitzgerald's earlier amateur writing for the stage in St. Paul and at Princeton University had all been very successful events. And my colleague, panel Eva, has written on some of those early juvenilia plays as well as on the vegetable. Um, his playlets, Porcelain and Pink and Mr. Icky, had been accepted for publication in the Smart Set in 1920 and reprinted in Tales of the Jazz Age in 1922. And based on their strength, the former editor and drama, drama critic George G. Nathan had told Fitzgerald, you have a decidedly uncommon gift for light dialogue. Keep at the dramatic form, you will do things. Reviews of The Vegetable when it was published in April were rather mixed, but the play did garner a lot of very fulsome praise. It was fearless and brilliant. Oh, sorry, my slide isn't moving. It was fearless and brilliant, one of the most humorous pieces of literature of the day, one of the funniest things we ever read, some of the most exquisite satire that it was ever our privilege to read, and it indicated that Fitzgerald may do big things in drama. Fitzgerald's close friend and literary critic Edmund Wilson told him it was marvellous, no doubt the best American comedy ever written. You have a great gift for comic dialogue, even if you never can resist a stupid gag, and you should go on writing plays. Fitzgerald himself was equally confident, perhaps characteristically more confident. He was sure that the play was going to make his fortune. It was undoubtedly the best thing I have ever written, and in fact, the best American comedy to date, he told his agent in August while his team were seeking advice from Eugene O'Neill about the possibilities of Broadway production. Excuse me, I'm, my slideshow has paused. So I'm going to use the slow buttons at the bottom. <laughs> but after all this praise, the stage production of The Vegetable was a disaster. The production was given a one week tryout run in Atlantic City in November, where it flopped. Fitzgerald's memories of the opening are painful. People rustled their programs and talked audibly in bored, impatient whispers, he recalled. After the second act, I wanted to stop the show and say it was all a mistake. The Fitzgeralds, like much of the rest of the audience, left for the play's third act. Plans for a longer run and a Broadway transfer were immediately scrapped and Fitzgerald was left $5,000 in debt. So what went so very wrong between print publication and stage performance? And I'll pause here and say that for this current project, uh, which looks at famous novelists who attempted to write for theatre at some point, I have been reading a lot of very bad plays and The Vegetable is not one of them. A lot of this praise that it gets on print publication is well deserved. So I'm really interested in this public reception, which is such a crucial one in terms of driving Fitzgerald back to prose publication after a great deal of stage writing and very enthusiastic stage writing in his youth. He does keep writing plays, but he never again stages one after The Vegetable. And actually The Vegetable is an interesting politically inflected text in its own right. William Goldhurst has tried to explain its neglect in Fitzgerald's scholarship by arguing the theme of the vegetable which dramatizes the absurdity of American politics might have seemed more vital to a contemporary than it would to most readers today. But I think that today's audience might find a lot that's interesting in a play about a populist everyman politician who's elected to the White House while on the run from the tax officer, who appoints his family members to influential government positions, who colludes with foreign powers, who seeks to strip members of the electorate that don't support him of the US citizenship, who brings America to the brink of war and who is finally impeached. So what happens? Why this shocking failure of the vegetable in performance? A lot hangs, I think, on this staging of not just an incompetent president, but of the impeachment process itself. We don't see the election process on stage, but we see the details of the impeachment process. The first problem, and the most straightforward one, between The Vegetable's print publication in April and its staging in November, the sitting US President Warren G. Harding died in office. For those of you, like me, who weren't educated in US political history, Warren G. Harding was the Republican President who served from 1921 to 1923. So that is the exact period of Fitzgerald's conceiving 
publishing and staging the vegetable. And it's clear that Fitzgerald's play was in part a satire on Harding's presidency. Harding was a dark horse to win the nomination at the Republican National Convention, and he conducted a primarily front porch campaign for election. The vegetable offers an extreme version of this, where Jerry Frost is interrupted at home to be told out of nowhere he's been given the Republican nomination, and then he moves straight from his living room to the White House. Jerry's jealous Secretary of Defense, General Pushing, parodies General John Pershing, the first US General of the Armies, whom Harding defeated in the 1920s presidential election. Both Jerry and Harding are alcohol drinkers during America's prohibition, both appoint incompetent and indeed fraudulent acquaintances to federal positions, both are given to rambling patriotic rhetoric. Now, this isn't a particularly cruel or extravagant satirizing. Jerry Frost is an incompetent president, but he's quite a likable figure, and the satire itself doesn't generate any critical kickback on print publication. It's broadly understood at that point that the play satirizes both Harding himself and broader social behaviors. But President Harding dies suddenly of a cardiac arrest in August, and America fell into mourning. Now, over the course of the next year, there are multiple revelations of scandal and corruption around Harding's presidency and cabinet. But in 1923, Harding is still very popular and well-respected. So Fitzgerald's satire now sits very uneasily alongside these other fawning eulogies that are being circulated. And I think this goes quite some way to explaining the vegetable sudden fall from grace. But there's another element I want to sketch out briefly here, which is less bound up in historical circumstance and more with the broader question of the shift from print to theatre performance. And it's the line between performance and the performative. And more specifically, the line between performing political processes on stage and the actual literal performativity of American politics. And I'm using the term performative here in both J.L. Austin's sense of how to utter is to do or to perform is to enact, as for example, in the legal action of saying I do in the marriage ceremony, and in Judith Butler's sense of how performance generates and maintains identity. There is no stable identity that exists before the performative enacts it. So in this context, you very literally are not president until you undertake the stylized performative legal action, act, actions that make you the president. Now, T. Austin Graham has argued very convincingly that theatricality often offers a site of safety in Fitzgerald's prose writing, both actual popular performance and the self-conscious theatricality of Fitzgerald's characters. The allure of theatricality and self-performativity, Austin Graham argues, is that obvious theatricality gives little reason to worry that its illusions might one day be dispelled, because there is never any doubt of its elusive character in the first place. Existence in this happy, self-aware and unthreatening unreality thus offers a cultural pressure valve, a means of temporary but nevertheless therapeutic escape for many of Fitzgerald's characters. Theatricality here operates as a kind of wish fulfillment exercise. Here's the distinction I want to make with particular attention to Austin Graham's phrase, happy, self-aware and unthreatening unreality. This is absolutely true of some of Fitzgerald's works, but it ignores the degree to which performance often becomes very real in much of his writing. And this effect is heightened in the theatre medium. There's a tendency in Fitzgerald prose criticism to use the word theatrical simply to mean false or unreal or, or inauthentic. But actually, performance often becomes real in Fitzgerald's early prose. In the short story, The Offshore Pirate, for example, Toby kidnaps Ardita and pretends to be a romantic fugitive pirate. Ardita falls in love with his character, but remains in love with him even when he reveals the subterfuge. In The Unspeakable Egg, George also wins back his fiancée by pretending to be a romantic tramp in what Kurt Kernut calls Fitzgerald's idea of, quote, the real self, which can be expressed only through the paradoxical recourse of role playing. And in a more specifically legal sense that's particularly relevant to what we see in The Vegetable, in the story The Camel's Back, a mock wedding ceremony at a raucous party turns out to be legally binding. So we've got a really literal example here of the performative, as J.L. Austin will later define it, and in fact using exactly the same example of the marriage ceremony that Austin himself uses. So performance very quickly melds into the performative in Fitzgerald's early work. 
And in the vegetable, we get a particular overlap with political performativity, the way in which scripted performance enacts political activity. American politics is performed, literally done in large part, by legalized performative action. The swearing into office, the signing of legislation, the granting of reprieves and pardons, and of course the impeachment ruling itself. And so there's a very, very fine contextual line between enacting this procedure on stage and enacting it in real life. Or enacting it on a specifically theatrical stage and enacting it on a different, although still very literal stage, as some of the examples on the screen here. One pre-impeachment example in the vegetable of performance making real, or the performative making real, is the burlesque of uniform swapping that goes on between Jerry and General Pushing. Here, the question of who is president and who is general is almost decided based on who wears which uniform. All right, since you know so much about being president, you try on my hat and coat and try it for a while. I'm a general and I'm going to war. You can stay around here. You can have my coat and my troubles. Here, the general is frightened by this prospect of being made to dress to perform as the president because within the logic of the play, which is simply an exaggerated version of the logic of modern political action, that would make him president. There's a dark flip side of the American dream that Fitzgerald worries at here about how, yes, anyone can become anything by performing that role rigorously enough. The populist ideal of a world in which anyone can be president is pushed to a frightening and disastrous extreme. So it's actually a very smart move for Fitzgerald to turn to the theatre medium to probe at this line between performance, the performative and political performativity. But it's too much for his audience at this moment in history. Harding has recently died and the vegetable is staging an impeachment process and ruling on stage. The passing down of, of the legal sentence is of course a profoundly performative utterance in J.L. Austin's terms. And in fact, in the play, Fitzgerald gives the Chief Justice a speech lifted nearly verbatim from President Andrew Johnson's impeachment in 1868, adding to the sense of actuality. The play is literally enacting this performative moment in live, embodied terms in front of a gathered public. So if there's a woolly line between performance and the performative, both in Fitzgerald's world and in the American political sphere, then even though the onstage impeachment here isn't legally valid, as in the wedding ceremony in The Camel's Back, it's close enough in form to be troubling in this ostensibly comic play in the direct aftermath of a popular president's death. It works too well in a sense. It's too close a melding of performance mediums. And interestingly, in later decades, Fitzgerald stands by the vegetable as a printed text, a sort of closet drama after the fact, but he tries his best to prevent it ever being staged again. No more stage productions on any account. I don't want the vegetable produced. Um, and to a director seeking staging permission, vegetable reads well, but it simply won't play. It reads well, but it has been a failure in a big way. This is not to say that I don't realize that the thing reads well or that I am not tremendously grateful, etc. It reads well, but it's not to be put on stage. And yes, Fitzgerald will keep writing plays all through the rest of his life, but he will not stage them. This is no longer the site of theatrical safety that T. Austin Graham identifies in Fitzgerald's earlier works as a happy, self-aware and unthreatening unreality or a temporary but nevertheless therapeutic exercise. And it's notable, I think, that the next novel that Fitzgerald publishes after the vegetable disaster is The Great Gatsby, where we see theatrical self-construction so spectacularly dissolve. A new fear of the performative performance appears in Fitzgerald's work at this point, I'm suggesting, as well as this understandable fear of the theatre space itself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simpson. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Eva Barbara Luchak. Uh, she is a professor at the Institute of English Studies, University of Warsaw and president of the Polish Association for American Studies. She is the author of Mocking Eugenics, American Culture Against Scientific Hatred, Rothlet Forthcoming, Reading and Eugenics in the American Literary Imagination, Paul Grave 2015, How They're Living Outside America Affected Five African American Authors Toward a Theory of Expatriate Literature, Mellon Press, 2010, 
editor and co-editor of six other volumes that include New Cosmopolitanism, Race and Ethnicity, Cultural Perspectives, The Greuter, 2018. Thank you so very much. And Hannah, I really, really appreciate, uh, cherished your, your presentation and especially that um, Fitzgerald's play uh, has been on my mind for some time. Um, um, and actually the, 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 this book entered, the, the play entered in my uh, book that is forthcoming just as the, the novel written by Sinclair Lewis, It Can Happen Here, also was briefly discussed in in the book. So um, I think we are sharing similar um, interests. Let me um, let me do the um, share the screen. Um, on October 27th, 1936, American theater witnessed an unprecedented artistic event. It was the opening night for the play It Can't Happen Here staged simultaneously in 15 different theaters across the country. The play was based on the best-selling satirical novel under the same title published by Sinclair Lewis only a year before and was part of the short-lived but extremely productive theater initiative of the Federal Theater Project. Directed by Hallie Flanagan, the Federal Theater Project um, was to bring to the average American socially re relevant theater. The issue addressed, it can happen here, was the most pressing of the time, the rise of fascism in Europe, as well as the rise of fascist sympathies in the US associated with the popularity of the Louisiana Senator Huey Long. From the point of view of American international and domestic politics, It Can Happen Here was one of the most significant plays produced in the U.S. before the outbreak of World War II. The scale of the play's production was truly impressive. Not only was it staged simultaneously in 15 cities, but also involved actors speaking various languages and dialects. As one of the play's reviewers enthusiastically pointed out, depending on the locale, quote, English, Yiddish, Italian, German, Cuban, and Negro, racial and language groups were represented, end of quote. The pace of adapting the novel to the stage was hectic. Sinclair Lewis and Jay Moffat, a journalist turned dramatist, were asked to work on the script in August of 1936, and the script was done in finished in late September. Nearly simultaneously with polishing the script, um, actors were being cast. Louis supervised the New York production himself, and the play did premiere as originally planned in October. The play's premise was simple and chilling. Under favorable circumstances, and as a result of the naivete and complacency of intellectual elites convinced that it can't happen here. America could slide into fascism. The play depicts two years in the life of Dorimus Jessup, a publisher of the Daily Informer and a competent businessman in a small Vermont town. Dorimus is known as a writer of, of editorials, not without wit and New England earthiness, and embodies a self-complacent intellectual trusting his sharp tongue and quick mind to battle extremism and demagoguery. Even though he has premonitions about the danger um, of the gospel preached on the radio by Bishop Frank, evocative of the radio priest Father Charles Coughlin, he's especially uncomfortable with Prang's League of Forgotten Men and with the preaching of the demagogue and anti-Semite Buzz Windrip, who dispenses the comforting gospel of the redistributing wealth. Dorimus doesn't seem to fully grasp the gravity of the situation. The situation changes when Dorimus witnesses the execution of his son-in-law by the corpus. These are Windrip's henchmen. Feeling a priestly obligation to tell the truth, he composes a heated editorial against the regime. From then on, events spiral out of control. 
Dorimus's daughter has to withstand the obscene advances of her former gardener and high level fascist administrator, while Dorimus himself is at first reduced to handyman in his own business and later put in a concentration camp where he has to endure regular beatings and humiliations. Having miraculously escaped the camp due to the underground resistance, Dorimus and his partner escaped to Canada as active members of the resistance group. The play ends with a dramatic scene of Dor Dorimus Jessup's daughter shooting Corpo Henchman and sacrificing her life to ensure a safe passage across the border of her teenage son and Dorimus himself. The play's reviews were mixed. Um, some of them very critical. Uh, the New York Times, uh, for example, on October 28th, um, noted the timeliness of the play um, and acknowledged that most of it doesn't does keep the audience attentive. And yet it argued that the characters are meagerly defined, the dialogue is undistinguished, and many of the scenes um, dawdle on one foot. Despite the skeptical reception by theater critics, Flanagan's theatrical experiment was a huge commercial and pedagogical success. In her memoir, she points out that the play was staged in cities, towns, and villages before audiences of every conceivable type and played under the Federal Theater 260 weeks. It Can Happen Here was undoubtedly one of the most powerful anti-fascist plays produced in the 1930s in the US. It was staged at the time when Hollywood studios withdrew from criticism of fascism out of fear of losing their financial foothold in Germany. Warren Brothers' uh, Confessions of a Nazi Spy produced in 1930. Or, nine, or Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator, filmed in 1940, for example, were one of the first cinematic satirical representations of Nazi Germany possible due to the Warner Bros. and Chaplin's ownership of the film studios and their independence of Hollywood politics. As a matter of fact, MGM was initially interested in filming Lewis's novel, yet with time abandoned the project, supposedly on the recommendation of the film star William Hayes himself. After World War II, uh, both the play and the book, however, were largely ignored due to the changing political climate, as well as Lewis's falling out of favor with critics. It is believed, and such position is, for example, adopted by Richard Lingeman, the author of the really uh, fabulous um, uh, biography of Sinclair Lewis. Uh, it is believed that Mark Shores, 1961, biting criticism of Lewis's style, executed in line with the standards of new, new criticism, was largely responsible for the dismissal of Lewis and his rich literary output that included 23 novels satirizing major American vices of the 1920s and the 1930s, and which earned him the Nobel Prize in Literature, the first one given to the American, as well as the title of, um, of the American um, Diogenes. The play, however, had its big comeback in the age of Trump. Trump's presidential campaign, as well as his presidency, awoke old fears and led intellectuals to search for repetitive patterns in American history. The play was staged by the Berkeley Repertory Theater on the eve of presidential elections in October 2016, and last year online in the audio form as late as September 2020. For the sake of this presentation, I would like to focus on changes implemented in the original play script authored by Lewis. They modified the novel's message and rewrote some of the targets of the novel's criticism. 
The changes were aptly noted by the New York Times critics in, the in 1936. In the stage version, the story is necessarily more circumscribed. It omits a good many of the characters, a good deal of the violence at the hands of the savage political army, all the Washington depravity and hocus pocus, and of course, the private meditation of Dorimus Jessup. The reviewer was correct. The play leaves out such bone chilling characters as Hector McGoblin, a medical doctor turned politician who ushers in laws and regulations along new scientific and medical lines. It also edits out Doremus's bitter speculations on the naivete of the liberal mind, confident uh, that, abuses, uh, that the abuse of power is unthinkable in American democracy. The play's scenes of violence are not as graphic as in the novel, most likely to meet the censor's approval, whereas Washington's uh, DC politicians are treated in a benign manner thanks to the change of the scenery from the US capital to the little provincial town. Given it, that it was Sinclair Lewis himself who adapted this book to stage, one would believe that the changes would keep the novel spirit. Even if this is the case, and they are in line with Lewis's desire to warn against the possibility of a demagogue seizing the American mind, an example of which would be Huey Long's rise to power in Louisiana, they leave out the discussion of the intellectual atmosphere conducive to the rise of fascism. In other words, Lewis's play focuses on the rise of political fascism at the expense of the novel's treatment of the dynamic fascism, which is a realization of ideological conservatism. Dynamic fascism of the time was inextricably intertwined with social Darwinism, white supremacy, biological ethics of might over right, and a desire to achieve racially pure and homogeneous nations. All these are part of the system of eugenics, which became the foundational science for the fascist dictatorships of the time. When in, 19, in the 1930s, Rudolf Hoess coined a not notorious adage that national so uh, socialism is nothing but applied biology, he spoke of eugenic ethics providing the foundations for the nation state. And thus, when Lewis's play leaves out eugenic discourse and focuses on the mechanical process of the populist dictator taking over, it fails to answer the question of what ideas have been conducive to the rise of fascism. What system of thought can be so appealing to the American mind that when well packaged may lead Americans to vote for the possibly fascist dictator? Moreover, the absence of the character of McGoblin mutes the links between American eugenics and German signs of racial hygiene, the existence of which have, has been noted by scholars such as Stefan Kuhn. In the novel, McGoblin is described as fascinated with Houston Stuart Chamberlain, uh, a British German um, author of one of the leading texts of Nazi racial policy and mysticism, Professor Hans Günther, uh, who penned um, a, um, a short ethnology of German people, which was the racial Bible to the Nazis, or Lothrop Stoddard, a member of the KKK, and the infamous American author of The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy, and whose racial writings were featured in Nazi school textbooks. Stoddard's name, mentioned in the novel, left out from the play, next to McGoblin, was regularly referred to in American prose uh, of the 1920s and the 1930s, such as Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby or George Schuyler's 1935 satire Black No More, and was synonymous with Nordi Nordicism and uh, racism. Interestingly, the removal of Dr. McGoblin and thus anti-eugenic component in the play was accompanied by the strengthening of the presence of two female characters, Lorinda Pike and Mary Dorimus' daughter. Mary saves the lives of Dorimus and her son, which is a bow to the ideals of sacrificial motherhood and at odds with the novel's skepticism with respect to traditional gender roles. 
The place celebration of female selflessness and self-immolation is accompanied by the ideological foresight and political perspicacity equated with the Larinda Pike, Dorimus's partner. In the novel, Larinda is uh, Dorimus's lover, undisturbed by his marriage and rather cynical in her judgment. In the play, she is the paragon of virtue and the true heroine, courageous with a deep political insight and having zero illusions about the real value of Buzz Windrip. Lorinda is a political compass which helps Dorimus navigate the political world. The character of Lorinda is so vividly depicted in the play that it cannot but bring to mind Dorothy Thompson, uh, Lewis's wife at the time. One is tempted to see a strengthening of Lorinda's part as Lewis's tribute to the woman who was the real impetus behind the novel. Dorothy Thompson was an American correspondent with strong political convictions and full awareness of the threat fascism posed to democracy. In 1934, residing in Berlin at that time, uh, Thompson was ordered by the sec secret police to leave Germany within 24 hours. A supposedly personal order from Hitler coming as a revenge for her unfavorable publication on the Nazi leader two years earlier had caused enraged British and American correspondents to come to her defense and put the female journalist into the spotlight. In an interview given at this time, Thompson voiced a trenchant critique of the social ethics of the no National Socialist Party foreshadowed in her earlier book, I saw Hitler. As early as Hitler's ascension to power, Thompson aptly diagnosed the threat German national socialism posed to democratic principles and warned against its desire to supplant egalitarianism with racial supremacy and an ethics of brotherhood with which trumpeted might overwrite. Lewis became inspired by her adventure and immediately set to work on a book with Thompson, uh, providing him with tips about both German fascism and the rise of fascist sympathies in the US. She shared with her husband the fear that Hitlerism could be compared to the rise of demagoguery in the US, which was gaining in power thanks to politicians such as Huey Long and orators, quote, with the tongue of the late Mr. Bryan, who can unite all the farmers with all the white collar unemployed, the loud evangelical preachers, the American Legion, the KKK, uh, KK and Henry Ford, end of quote. Being herself an accomplished journalist, Thompson also gave advice regarding the novelist, uh, novelistic form. I really think you should consider making it um, a priori satire, she coached Lewis, and thus oversaw the birth of It Can't Happen Here. The name of Thompson didn't appear on the book's cover, nor was acknowledged by Lewis. However, it would be only fitting that the character of Lorinda would receive a remake to pay tribute to the woman who not only provided the writer with the topic and materials for his novel, but also withstood bouts of his alcoholic rage and jealousy over the growth of her journalistic career, which eventually led to their separation two years after the publication of the novel. And the last change, the final, and I'm uh, wrapping up, between the novel and the play involves their form and the mode. The novel is the political satire, whereas the play adopts the convention of realism with strong ap apocalyptic elements. The shift away from satire to political dystopia blunted the novel's political edge. Whereas the characters in the novel could be easily identified with sp specific political figures such as Huey Long, assassinated a month before the novel's publication, or Father Coughlin, a Catholic preacher known for his nativism and highly conservative radio broadcasts, the allusion to specific individuals in the play um, uh, is much more pronounced. And thus the viewer didn't love at the main actors of the specific political situations in which the US found itself on the brink of World War II, but watched in a distant manner the naivete of the American liberal mind. By abandoning the satirical, the play didn't have the political power of the novel and its bite was harmless and directed at no one really.
Paradoxically, what could have been perceived as the place political weakness in 1936 was responsible for some, and was responsible for some really poor reviews, became its strength in 2016 and in 2020. Um, and this that was rewritten by Tony Tacconi and Bennett Kahn, so as to feature a more contemporary language and values, the play strongly resonated with new times. The playwright and director and the director built on the play's universalism and adopted it to the age of Trump in such a way as to make it a powerful warning against American ideals of democracy being hijacked by demagoguery and populism. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Thank you. So I know I remember that her Simpson shared her email in her slideshow. I'm not sure if you did so. Maybe our future attendees want to see in the conference, want to email you and ask you some questions. Uh, if you like, and if you mind, would you please share your email? Maybe some people want to reach out to you. Dr. Lucek. Okay, now I'm gonna go last. My presentation has some participatory elements to it. So if you mind, uh, start your videos or participate in reading some codes. Uh, thank you. So that is in the, thank you. That is, uh, so Dr. Lushek email is in the chat now. Okay. Now I'm gonna start share. Votes for women. Uh, with the continuing title, according to the production, a doctor and director, Dr. Cheryl Black, is commemorating of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The production was scheduled for March 11th till 14th, 2020, and a matinee show uh, on March 15th. Some of you might remember what happened on March 11th. Well, I do. While the production was scheduled for 7.30 p.m., we received an email from the University of Missouri system notifying us of the campus closure. The MU Theater included votes for women for its 2020 spring season. I remember that evening. See, most of the tickets were sold to students as course requirements for their classes in theater department. And in the audience were some of the student actors' friends. You guessed it right. A campus production with an ensemble of student actors. Now you may ask why these details matter. Remember, it was during Trump's presidency and I was pretty confident that the coming election would be a historical one. I did not know the extent of, the pan of this pandemic would change my and my students' lives and educational experience. Furthermore, I didn't know the extent of academic injustices that I had to experience as a graduate student and the extent of injustices I would observe as a graduate instructor. Have I lost you yet? Hope not, because I'm going to talk about a theatrical production encompassing 246 years from 1774 till the present time, from the formation of a national government the formation of the Fair Fight Movement in 2019 by Stacey Apple. In this presentation, I'll talk about the production, some of the dramaturgical processes, we'll share some of the design pictures with you, and share some of the director, adapters, thoughts about the play. I interviewed Dr. Black a year after the production came to an end in a friendly setting. This is how the production began. Actors marched through the house onto the stage, carrying banners that read, votes for women, all for suffrage club, 
taxation without representation is tyranny, as true now as in 1776. In custom circa 1913, wearing yellow roses and singing, moving on over, or we'll move on over you. I can chant it with me. Move on over or we'll move on over you. Move on over or we'll move on over you. For women's time has come. And it ended with the whole ensemble saying, my vote is my voice and the voice of all struggled so that I may have my voice. It was such an empowering moment. And I hoped that the audience might believe that we the people hold power. I'm from Middle East, Iran to be exact. I believe that throughout our history, precisely who we are and who is granted a voice in the Democratica has been a source of contention. And as Dr. Black mentioned in an email, votes for women docu-dramatic in form tells the long history of women's quest for enfranchisement in the United States. She observed in the same email that the text encompasses how that history intersects with the larger story of securing America's long deferred dream of liberty and justice for all. The performance text is a product of extensive dramaturgical research, exploring archives such as correspondence, songs, speeches, poems, newspaper and magazine articles, autobiographicals, and other first-hand accounts and orga organizational websites. These are some of the pictures that we use for the dramaturgy And as Dr. Simpson was talking about the theatrical elements of politics, which I would say it is globally, and you can see that. Now, to delve deeper into the process, into the adaptation process, I want to ask one of the audience members to unmute and read this code for us. Don't be shy. Go on. I think um, be, yeah. 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 Uh, so woman suffrage is the reform against nature. Look at these ladies sitting on the platform. Observe their physical inability, their mental disability, their spiritual instability and general debility. Could they walk up to the ballot box, mark a ballot and drop it in? Obviously not. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Mary Jenny Howe, or Howie, I don't know if I'm saying it right, wrote this anti-suffrage monologue for the drama group of the New York Women's Suffrage Party and other suffrage organizations in 1913. In it, she parodied anti-suffragist arguments that relied on stereotypes of female dependence, irrationality, and delicacy. Dr. Black, adapted that quote for the script in the first act, introducing how it acted by Zoe, by a narrator uh, who was Tim. So I need someone in the audience to read Tim and some other person to read how. So this is how it was, go on Hannah. So this is how it went into the script. I'll be Tim. <laughs> In 1913, heterodoxy founder Mary Jean Howe penned a parody of an anti for the drama group of the New York Women's Suffrage Party. Okay, thank you. And who wants to read the second part? Do I have to read the whole thing? <laughs> I knew it. This is not... You can read the first paragraph, then we're going to have another person. About the, yeah, the first one. Okay. Oh. Um, please do not think of me as old fashioned. I pride myself on being a modern, up to date 
woman. I believe in all kinds of broad-mindedness, only I do not believe in woman suffrage because to do what that would be to deny my sex. Uh, this is how it was implemented and it was how it was acted in the production. So the rest of it, someone else, please. Yes, yes. Look at these ladies sitting on the platform. Observe their physical inability, their mental disability, their spiritual instability and general debility. Could they walk up to the ballot box, mark a ballot and drop it in? Obviously not. Let us grant for the sake of argument that they could mark a ballot, but could they drop it in? Ah, no. All nature is against it. The laws of man cry out against it. The voice of God cries out against it. And so do I. Enfranchisement is what makes man, man. Disenfranchisement is what makes woman, woman. Thank you. Thank you. So this was the process, basically. And this is how Dr. Black masterfully, really, adapted the play and put it in from the real text. Another, uh, other sources, notable sources that uh, she incorporated in the text are Elizabeth Robbins' Votes for Women that was first produced in 1907, presented at the Court Theater in the Sloan Square, London, and Augustine Daly's Under the Gaslight. So the scene that you'll see, that you see here was actually this performance stage, comically, dramatically, and we could see like the beautiful fashion, uh, the light would go through the house. It was amazing, but, and I want to talk more about the text and all the research and adaptations. Well, after all, I helped a little with the dramaturgy of the process, but this production had other significant design elements that I want to acknowledge here. First, I want to acknowledge Dr. Mark Vital who is the assistant professor of custom design at the University of Missouri, uh, Missouri, Missouri, who designed these fascinating customs. So this is Zoe. So I acted like these characters. We can see all the details that went into all these customs and I'm really do not need to say anything because they're telling. And the scenic design, uh, I want to hear, uh, I want to, uh, and Mimi Hedges, who was a scenic designer. I, I honestly, I had some pictures of the production, but I don't know where they are. So this is uh, what we had there on the stage. Okay. Now I'm gonna stop the sharing screen and talk to you about the interview. So I wanted to hear Dr. Black's thoughts after the final production and the U.S. Going, uh, ongoing struggle for the voting rights. So in an interview, delightful as it has always been, he talked about the show and the historical events in days leading to the election and ever since. She told me that this satirical, ironical pageant, as she called it, uh, was a work of theater historian who believes in the didactic nature of performing history. Performances like Votes for Women should be standard practices in high schools and on university campuses, as fewer people tend to read and learn about history. As was my own experience, many in the ensemble found the process, the ongoing dramaturgical research and rehearsal process as inspirational and enlightening. We talked about how this play is historically relevant and how the events in the play do not end in 1920. Then just before the ensemble's final lines, it is a, a Stacey Abrams saying, go to my vote is my voice, end quote. The right to citizenship is a never-ending global phenomenon 
filled with the stories of disenfranchisement. As the audience is reminded over and over again in the play, voting is not a gift, but a hard won fight. The events leading to January 6, 2021, and the pending legislative efforts in the states aiming to limit the voting rights and practices associates uh, plays like Votes for Women. Votes for Women also requires a diverse ensemble, providing inclusive acting opportunities. As Dr. Black uh, said, as, Dr. as does Dr. Black, I hope to see more plays like this on campuses as educational tools. Remember yet those student actors that I talked about in the beginning? I can never forget their tears. I guess some had to return to their houses and share one laptop with their siblings. Some might have come close to become homeless. Some had to quit their programs. But maybe I tell these stories in other context. Who knows? Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to be mindful of time. I want to thank you for uh, the panelists, for your resiliency. And I want to thank people in the audience for your resiliency. This is not a normal setting. I know that. Uh, so we are going to go into Q&A section, but I'm going to stop recording. And I want to thank you all for uh, seeing us, listening us, and uh, listening to us. And if you have any questions, you have our emails. Thank you.